Hello out there. Uh, I'll turn it over to y'all. Uh, do y'all have any questions about the PCT in general or, you know, through hiking or the Sierra Nevada, this section um, that I just went through or just anything at all about the PCT or gear or what's happening, any of that stuff, I will be happy to answer any questions that y'all might have. All right, let's see. How do you like the carbon trekking poles compared to the others? Um, I really like them. I mean, I guess in my mind, I know I need to be a little more careful with them. <laughs> like, for example, uh, singing and dancing and whatever going down the trail. You know, my other ones, I used to hit them together like it was an instrument in these. You know, I kind of tend to try not to do that. And um, in the snow, you know, when I've uh, slid down and tried to catch myself, I've thought, oh, man, I hope they don't break. But so far, they've been great. Um, I, I really love my trekking poles a lot. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I haven't, I haven't had any issues with them. And the locking mechanisms on these poles are really good. Um, they don't slip at all. How often have you had to hike uphill to find better spots to cross rough streams? Okay, um, luckily I found out that uh, they have, um, and this is great for people if you know folks like doing section hikes um, or the JMT or anything like that, the PCT has the, the PCT water report and they've also been putting like snow reports and um, like river crossings and stuff like that on it too. In the desert it's like, uh, you know, to, to uh, let you know if the water source is flowing or not. In the Sierras it's to let you know, you know, if you should go for it or not. Um, so the river crossings have been pretty sketchy and most of the time I've been able to find a log and somebody that went before will leave a note um, on that water report that I was talking about and say like, log, one mile upstream. Um, I haven't had to go too far. Um, I would say a mile or less on uh, most of the crossings to find something a little bit better, which I'm really glad because I heard like, oh man, you'll have to walk five or six miles. You know, um, there's only been one that was, well, I guess really two, um, that were really kind of sketchy that there was no better way. Um, and in those instances, you can typically, you know, if you're hitting them late in the afternoon and they're sketchy, if you just camp and wait till the next morning, a lot of times the, the flow rate is down. I guess, you know, logically, uh, if the snow refreezes, you know, and that water has had a chance that melted from the day before to, to flow down, um, then, you know, the, the river's not going to be flowing as quickly. So the later in the day it gets, the more snow melt you have, the faster the river flows. I mean, it makes sense. Um, so there, there was one that I had to swim across. Um, luckily, you know, I haven't been alone for most of the Sierra Nevada. So, uh, but yeah, there was definitely, um, one that, that we swam. There was no log, you know, that we could tell nobody had written about one in the report and the flow was low enough and we had enough people to kind of, you know, help each other out that, that we made it work just fine. But, uh, but it's been an adventure. That's for sure. Okay. How far are your videos behind where you're hiking? Um, mileage wise, um, I guess about a few hundred miles, um, time wise a few weeks, I guess, <laughs> but it, it just depends, you know, um, how much footage is covered in one, uh, episode. All right. Are there any resupply points in the Sierras or do you have to make it straight through? Oh, well, there are, um, so you don't have to make it straight through. That would be, that would be crazy. Uh, that would be a lot of weight, but the, the, so you start at Kennedy Meadows. The next place that you could potentially go is Lone Pine, um, which is only like two days North of Kennedy Meadows or so. So, and then after that, you're looking at six days to eight days, um, to, uh, Kearsarge Pass, which goes into Bishop. But the problem is that's like a six to seven mile side trail and you're talking about in snowy, rough terrain. So luckily I was able to do Forrester and Kearsarge Pass in one day and I felt like I was going to die from exhaustion, but I did it. Um, but you know, a lot of people take like a full day to do Kearsarge Pass. So that's like six or seven miles of non-trail miles. And then the day that you go back in, you know, if you do 10 and you've only got a few miles on the PCT of actual mileage. So you're almost taking a zero day pretty much, or you're doing at least two Nero's, um, just to get on the side trail to go to town, you know, so you could skip Kearsarge, but you would be toting a lot of days of food or starving yourself. So 
that was that was not fun. There are other side trails that um, are even longer. Uh, I think Perk took one called Sawmill Pass, and it drops you down in the desert where he said there was no water, and you know it was a big drop in elevation because you know you're up in the mountains, and then now you're down in the desert, and uh, and it was like. I can't remember 12 miles or 14 miles or something like that so I just didn't want to do that I ended up just carrying extra weight more food um, but there there are places like VVR you ride a little pontoon boat to get it's Vermilion Valley Resort but don't let the word resort fool you because <laughs> it should be called like Vermilion Valley Fish Camp I mean it was great little charming place but uh, it was really expensive because they know that they are very conveniently located and then you know it takes them a while to get food and stuff like that in there but uh, but anyhow, so there are places along the way, you don't have to tote everything, um, but it's just not as convenient on, in the Sierras as it is in other, you know, as it was in the desert anyway. Um, I work at a post office in Montana and get sad when I see supply boxes from CDT being returned unclaimed. Does that mean they quit or just didn't need the supplies? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I would say probably a little bit of both. Um. I, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, some people I'm sure thought maybe they would stop in a certain place and then decided to not go there. But in that instance, um, I mean, you work at the post office, so could they call and have it like sent ahead and pay postage for it at the next place if it was extra or bounce it ahead if it was priority? I mean, I feel like they could do that, right? So, um, so maybe they either forgot about it, they didn't know it was coming, <laughs> it was like a surprise and somehow the message was lost, or... Um, or yeah, they, they quit. I don't know. Uh, I did have something kind of similar like that happen. Um, a friend of mine that I grew up with, she wanted to send me a care package while I was on the AT and she asked my mom to get an address from the next place so that, um, I would be surprised. And so my mom was like, Hey, what's an, what's an address for the next place you'll be stopping? And I told her, but whenever my mom sends something, she's like, okay, I sent such and such and it will be there in two days or on Monday or this or whatever. But she never did that, so I thought, okay, she decided not to send something. And I felt bad being like, yo, mom, did you send that package? Because, you know, I just didn't want to be like, I don't know, make her feel bad if she forgot or didn't or whatever. So she never said to me, yes, there's a package waiting for you at such and such. So it was like several months after I had finished the AT, like around Christmas or something, and my friend Ashley was like, so did you ever get that package? And I was like, what? What package? And I felt so awful here. She thought I had gotten it and just didn't even care or thank her for it, you know. But anyway, she was able to call the outfitter and, you know, get it sent to my house and whatever. But, but so things like that could happen, but probably they just either decided to skip that area or, yeah, they quit. Okay, let's see. Um, how many days of food were you able to fit in your bear canister? That's a really good question. Okay, so I'm just going to be very honest. Um, my bear can is called the the weekender uh i don't i don't remember the the capacity of it right now offhand but um it did not fit all my food i still had a bear bag there are a lot of people who just to meet the requirement will get um i don't know if y'all have seen like the bv 500s the the bear vault 500 that's what the bear can that most people carry um but they'll even get not that big one they'll get like the little bitty one so that they just meet the requirement of oh i have a bear canister so you're not getting you know in trouble with a ranger or anything because all you have to do is have a bear canister nobody makes you prove that all your food will fit in it so uh i would say most of the through hikers their all of their food does not fit in their bear can not the first day out of town anyway because it's such a long stretch so i'm not saying that it's right that they're doing that i'm just saying that the whole point of you should carry a bear canister um, to have all your food in and, and protect bears from getting your food. It, people are just meeting the requirement and they're not, it, it's not actually being accomplished, I guess is what I'm saying, by them requiring it. So it's kind of silly anyway. I mean, it's up to you to take care of yourself and to make sure that you don't have your food, you know, under your head as a pillow. Um, and I think people are doing that. Uh, but so yeah, not all of my food fit when I was carrying eight days of food. Um, I think that I would say I could probably have fit like four to five days in that bear can probably. Um, so maybe, you know, if you do want to go through this year's and you're going to carry eight days of food, then I would suggest stepping it up to a bigger size than the BV 500 and for me, the weekender. So mine was a wild ideas barricade weekender. So, okay. Uh, thanks Dixie. Wild ideas now makes the blazer, which is between the weekender and expedition was wondering which to get. Okay. So yeah. Um, 
I, I would definitely go with the blazer if you're going to go more than four or five days. And, and, and cram it four or five days into the weekender. Obviously, it's called the weekender, I guess, for a reason, right? Um, so the blazer might be better. But as far as the blazer or the expedition, I'm not sure. I guess you could call them and, and ask them to see what they think. Or I, I wonder if anybody in the um, Homemade Wanderlust Backpacking Forum on Facebook, I wonder if they have used the, the barricade brands at all or even just their bv their bear vaults anything just what capacities they're using um so you might want to try to reach out in there and see if anybody can answer i wonder how carbon fiber would stand up to a bear if the pole snaps so easily i think i'll stick with the bear vault <laughs> i mean good point however i mean just the i guess engineer in me you know you think of like a little thin pole uh gonna be much easier to snap than like you know a big bear can but I guess also you're talking about the weight of me versus the weight of a bear. Um, but, I mean, as long as you're not, uh, like, I still wouldn't keep your bear can in your tent with you. Uh, so, as long as it's out there, you know, I'm kind of like, it's my offering to the bears. Like, I'm not going to starve to death in one day. I can find a way to get to town or, you know, whatever if for some reason my bear or my food was taken. But as long as the bear can have it not in my tent with me, then that'd be great. <laughs> so, but yeah, uh, to each his own. I, I, the bear vault is the most popular bear can out here. I see the BB 500 all the time. And then, like I said, the smaller ones just for people wanting to meet the requirements. Um, yeah. All right. Let's see. Do you get altitude sickness? Did you have to pitch your tent in the snow? Okay. So I don't think that I, I didn't get altitude sickness. I will say that I noticed as I started getting higher up, um, being short of breath, even on flat areas, um, and I think there were a couple of days where I had a headache. I haven't really had headaches on the trail, so I would say that it was probably associated with something like that. But I made a point to hydrate really well, um, to drink. Uh, I actually got these little packets um, from an outfitter in Bishop that was just like uh, replenishing, you know, electrolytes and all that. And they called it like altitude something. Um, but I think, you know, we've kind of gradually gone up from the desert. So it's not like I went from sea level to... 14,000 on Mount Whitney, you know, in one day, uh, like a lot of people do. And then they, you know, they do get sick. So it's been a very gradual, um, I mean, sure. It might be a couple thousand feet change in one day, but, uh, you know, still, but no, I, I haven't had to pitch my tent on the snow. Um, I have been on like a rock Island and snow all around me, but I've managed to find like a dry spot. And, uh, also somebody emailed and messaged and wanted to know, um, about would I suggest having like the freestanding contraption for the um, z pax duplex or like a freestanding tent? Do I recommend that? Um, so my uh, I've said this before. My big Agnes Fly Creek UL2 was not fully freestanding. So if it was going to rain, you would need to stake out the rain fly. Um, sure, I could make it stand up without worrying about you know if it was real rocky without worrying about staking it out and have some kind of um, cover over me, but in the rain, it would have been pointless. Uh, the duplex, you know, you do have to stake it or what I've done in, um, some areas that were really rocky, uh, or if it was real windy, I'll like stake it and then put a rock on top of it. But if I can't get the stake in the ground, you can literally put the stake through the loop, lay it on the ground and put a rock on top of it. And it works just fine. So, um, found ways to make it work without any issue. So, Sure, while a freestanding tent might be easier, to me it was worth saving the weight, and uh, I really like the duplex, so, um, and I've been able to make it work. I haven't had a night where I'm like, well, I guess I can't make it work. I'll have to cowboy, or I hope it doesn't rain, or, you know, anything like that. I have cowboy camp, though, um, in the Sierras, in the desert, and uh, just sometimes you, if you want to get up real early, it's just convenient, and in that case, I'll put my tent down on the ground and just lay on top of it as if it was a ground cloth, you know, so... How solid is the material of the duplex tent? Could a stick or a dog make a hole in Cuban fiber? Um, I mean, supposedly it's pretty strong. I do have some very small pinholes on the top of mine. I actually emailed z -Pex because they have this tape stuff that they actually attach, like, where you close the doors to your tent and, like, um, the lines to, like, stake it out and stuff like that. Um, so I'm hopefully going to get some of that just to kind of cover those little pinholes. But... I mean, I don't know of anybody that has, I'm trying to think of if I've seen anybody that has a dog sleeping in their duplex, but I mean, it's, it's pretty 
strong material, you know. Um, but I think definitely you could puncture it. So I, I don't I don't know for sure on the the stick and the dog, but that probably I would contact them and see what they say. I mean, they're probably going to tell you to be very careful with it. But um, but yeah, I'm I'm sorry I can't answer that one better. Do you let's see ever do any real cooking or only dehydrated meals? Tea, coffee. Um, so, I mean, I've, I have packed out, I'm trying to think about, um, I don't know that I've packed out any, like, legit real food on this trail. Um, I'm trying to think. I, I mean, I did s'mores, you know, I packed out stuff to do s'mores. Um, I mean, on the AT, there were times when I packed out, like, some meat. Oh, yeah, we did bacon. Um, we did bacon one night. So, yeah, there have been times where definitely I'll get some, you know, real food, uh, whether on the AT or like I said, the bacon on this trail, uh, especially if it's like a shorter section and I'm not carrying like a bunch of food, you know, so if it's like a two or three day section, then I don't mind the extra weight because, you know, real food does weigh more. I mean, it's just, it's got the water weight in it, right? It's not dehydrated. So, uh, I pack out avocados a lot. Um, but not a whole lot of actual cooking. I, I've been wanting to do like those hobo dinners. Um, I don't know if y'all have heard of that, but you take like hamburger meat, patty it up, put onions and potatoes and carrots and Worcestershire sauce. I can't say that very well, but anyhow, and then roll it full and that would be great to put on some coals. And, and I've been talking about that a little bit, but, um, I don't know. I might, you know, today when I resupply, I might get some, uh, some, um, like brats or something like that. Cause you know, stuff like that's fun and it's a morale booster. And I have been, um, toting out garlic and like roasting like cloves of garlic. You can stab it on a stick or like cut a V in a stick and just kind of wedge it in there and roast it over the fire. So, um, I'm glad you said something about that. Okay. Uh, and then tea and coffee always like I drink coffee every morning. Um, I've been cooking on the fire at night to conserve fuel lately. Um, but in the morning for breakfast and at lunch, I usually use my stove. And, uh, yeah, sometimes tea, sometimes coffee. Coffee always in the morning, though. Cold nights. Um, there have been some pretty chilly nights. Um, there were one or two nights where my shoes were completely frozen <laughs> uh, when I woke up the next morning. And, um, but it really hasn't been too bad. And, you know, the Sierras have not been real windy, which I was kind of worried about. I mean, we've had a couple windy days, but judging from the desert and how windy it was, I was, I was really worried, um, that, you know, I was just going to freeze to death and it would always be cold and windy, but I've, I've sweated walking over the snow. So it gets hot during the day. All right. What are you eating now compared to what you were eating? Um, well, I mean, for example, in the mornings I was doing oatmeal like every morning, uh, for a while, but I've kind of swapped to something non cook, even though I still boil water for my coffee. Um, I've just kind of started like getting a little worn out on oatmeal and I've learned on this trail. I learned from the AT, uh, to swap stuff out before you get sick of it. <laughs> so I, I've, I about ruined myself completely forever on peanut butter. Um, but I've started being able to come around to it. Um, some of those like squeeze packets, like the Justin's or, or like the little Jif things, you know, I can snack on it. I can do peanut butter crackers. I just don't want a tortilla with peanut butter on it. There's no way I'm not, I just can't do it. That's blah. But, uh, but yeah, there are some things like cliff bars, but here recently I started getting cliff bars. Um, you know, kind bars are good. I, I don't know. I try to swap the bars that I carry each section. I really love dry, um, uh, like dehydrated fruit. Um, and, and stuff like that. Jerky. Uh, yeah. I, you know what I really wish that I could do those. Um, there are these paleo meals to go and I really wish that I could eat those for like all my meals and then for the snacks, um, do things like bars and, um, things that have, that aren't just like straight sugar. Although I do love Snickers and Butterfinger. I really like Butterfingers, but, um, I just wish that I could kind of quit having like straight sugar intake so that I would be a little bit healthier, but those paleo meals to go are so good. Um, I got a couple of those and tried them and you know, uh, yeah. So that's really what I wish I could do. So if you, you know, if money's not, not a, a concern and you're preparing for a backpack trip, I definitely suggest those paleo meals to go. And then, you know, some snacks like fruit and jerky and stuff like that, um, during the day would be good, man. Y'all get me talking about food and I'll just talk about it forever. Uh, what is your pack weight after water and food? I know it depends on water supply, but an average. So the day I left, um, Scout and Frodo's in 
San Diego, I think my pack was like 32 pounds. I want to say it's like with a 15-ish pound base weight, and that was with food and water for four days, maybe? Uh, and then the water, I think I had like a liter or two. So, um, I think it's a little less, my base weight is a little less now because I have shaved some things off. Well, once I sent home the micro spikes and the, the ice axe, but, um, I'm actually going to do another lighter packs for like all of my Sierra Nevada gear. Um, so I don't know exactly what my base weight is, but I'll, I'll find out with that. But now it should be a little bit less than the, the 15 once I send all that home. Um, but I, I mean, I think most people out here are definitely less than 40 pounds. Um, I think mine probably ranges between, if I had to guess, like 28 and 35, which is kind of a, a big range, but um, it's definitely less than it was on the AT because, you know, I've got lighter gear this time, but uh, in the desert I was toting a lot of water. There was, there was a time, uh, it was a 40 mile dry stretch, I toted 6 liters of water, so that's what, 2.2 pounds per liter? So, yeah, because one kilogram is 2.2 pounds. One liter is one kilogram, yeah. So, it's it's pretty heavy. Dixie, your videos seem to be taking on a more, call it, spiritual feeling lately. Are you feeling changed by your experiences? Or are you just sharing that side more? Um, you know, I think maybe a little bit of both. That's a good question. Um, I think that the trail continues to... Uh, allow you time to reflect on your life and um, like I've said before you know your your mind or at least my mind is a much noisier place than I had imagined uh, especially when I started the AT and just kind of where I w was in my life at that time um, I had just left a job that I was very very unhappy unha at and uh, just did not put me in a good situation or nor was it healthy at all in general so uh, you know, when I left that job and, and um, moved back home and and then started the AT, you know, my mind was just not settled. And you use things every day to distract you from that. Facebook, email, just calling your friends, um, the radio, music, whatever. So when you're out there on the trail and you make a point, especially in the mornings, I love the mornings because they're so still and like the birds are kind of starting to chirp, but they haven't gone crazy yet. You know, you might see a deer walking around and everything's just kind of like kind of calm and still and you really have time to like think and all of the things that you don't want to think about, but you probably need to think about and work through. Those are the first things that like surface in your mind. So I feel like because I've done the AT and now I'm on this one, like I have a lot less noise. Um, and I don't know, I just think about random things. <laughs> so I guess I just try to share with y'all, like when I have a, a thought that I keep kind of, um, it keeps recurring, I decide maybe to like, well, maybe I should share this, you know, this is what I'm currently thinking about. And, um, I think everyone knows, you know, on a backpacking trip, like you wake up and you cook and you hike and you eat and you sleep and you do it all again, you know, but I just kind of want to try to share some of the other things that happen out here, whether it's thoughts or, um, the people that you meet and, and just all of that, uh, that's part of a through hike that maybe is not apparent on the surface. So I don't know if that helps at all, but, um, but yeah, nature is a pretty special thing to, uh, immerse yourself in. So <laughs> maybe I'm just more comfortable sharing now, I guess. How do you feel schedule wise? Um, I feel good still. Like I'm not, it's still possible to get to Canada on time. And, you know, if I feel like I have to flip for some reason, something unforeseen happens, I guess I could, but especially now that I've trudge through the Sierras. I really don't want to, um, to do that. I want to just do a full Nobo through hike. Um, but I, I think it's doable. It's, it's possible. It's just, I can't get stuck in the, these vortexes that you, you find in town, you know, you get to town and like today I'm going to have free pizza for lunch. There's this place that does free pizza. Like how can you be a through hiker and on trail hear about free pizza and not get off and go to that town? I mean, come on. It's like, you just wouldn't be a through hiker anymore <laughs> if you didn't go get free pizza. So um, there are things like that 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 are are a distraction. But I mean, a distraction from what? Like it's all it's all part of the experience. You know, I feel I feel pretty good about it. I think uh, I think I'll be able to. I think I'm stubborn enough that I'm gonna find a way to make it work because I came out here to through hike it, and that's what I'm gonna do. Let's see. Did you get a new knife? Yes, um, I did. Actually, hold on one second. Uh, so I lost mine, or it was like taken while I was in Lone Pine, and um, so my buddy Patrick, uh, MT Knives, he sent me another one, and this one's a black one. But I don't know if you can see. He put like the little 
homemade Wanderlust logo on it uh, along with his. So I don't know. I thought that was pretty cool. Are you planning any more trips home or off trail? Or are you pretty much on the trail until you finish? I'm on the trail until I finish. Uh, that's cool that it's got your logo. Yeah, you know, I thought that was really neat that he did that. He should do a special edition homemade wander last night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll tell him that. I don't know how, how he'll how he'll feel about that. He, he might. He might be up for the, the challenge. Um, yeah, that would actually be really cool. But yeah, I, I thought it was neat that he put that, that little logo on there. I thought that was nice of him to do it. But uh, yeah, he's my buddy um, through... Um, I don't know if y'all have heard me mention before in any videos, the survival podcast, but it's just, it's like my favorite podcast and pretty much one of the only ones I listen to, but, um, he's part of that community. So that's, that's how I know him. But anyway, so yeah, if you're looking for a podcast, that's a, that's a good one to listen to. I call, um, Jack Spirica, who's over it. I call him my podcast dad. So, <laughs> but, uh, anyhow, yeah, I, I listened to it a lot and that, that's actually, um, I went and gave a presentation there and the video is, is posted of that. Uh, I gave a presentation about backpacking and kind of how some of the gear could relate to um, preparedness and things like that. Is it true you get sunburned on the inside of your nose or a roof of your mouth? You know, I didn't, well, let me say this. I always, because I heard about that, I stuck sunscreen on my finger and stuck it up my nose, you know, and twirled it around. Um, so I guess you could get sunburned on your nose. I didn't have any issues with the roof of my mouth. Um, but I did wear sunscreen a good bit. I honestly think that the sunscreen, um, like dried my legs out. I don't know if it's just like what's in it or what, but my legs ended up getting like really dried out. I was using um, like 50 SPF. Uh, so my skin was hurting because it was so dry and I ended up having to put lotion on it a lot. And now, um, I don't even really put it on my legs because they've got that base tan going. I know, I know I should, but I don't know. Sometimes I feel like when you put stuff like that on your skin every single day, it just like, I don't know, sometimes, sometimes can do more damage, but, um, yeah, my face is pretty, pretty, dark. Uh, I try to remember to put it on, but I wear the hat too. So, uh, but yeah, definitely no vitamin D shortage out here. That's for sure. Um, just want to say, keep it up. I watch all your videos. Thank you, Rusty. I appreciate that. Um, uh, I, uh, yeah, I try, like I said, I try to, you know, show y'all what it is like out here. Um, and you know, as much as I can, uh, kind of capture. So, um, but that's why I like doing these Q and A's because that, you know, judging from what y'all ask here, I also, you know, try to make sure that I capture some of that in the videos. Um, what are the night skies like? Oh, beautiful. <laughs> like stars for days. That's why I really enjoy cowboy camping. And, um, when I do, you know, I always lay there and look and I'm just like, wow, this is pretty, this is pretty awesome. And, uh, you know, this is what it's all about is just like appreciating and enjoying things like that, 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 a lot of times in normal life, you don't take the time to stop and smell the roses and go, oh, wow. Like, really, when's the last time you looked up at the sky and, like, paid attention to the stars, you know? I know in normal life, I don't that often. Um, let's see. Did your plantar fasciitis improve with the new shoes? Yes! It was so, I mean, it's crazy. It's like, you learn little things about your body. So my feet tell me when my shoes have 500 miles on them. Like they're like, um, hello, we need more support. And I can start feeling twinge. And actually, uh, I'm not exactly sure how many miles are on now, but I felt a twinge the other day. So I've got my mom sending me, um, a pair, uh, to like the next town. Um, because I just, I don't know. And it's so funny. Cause I was thinking, you know, my, my shoes are getting kind of high up there in miles now. And then I felt that little twinge and I was like, yep, time for another pair. It's just, and, and some people can go forever until their foot falls out, but my feet are just not, they won't let me do that. Um, how has the PCT changed you versus the AT? I think, I don't know that it's any, um, it has changed me in a way that's necessarily different than the changes I saw myself on the AT. I think it's just, um, reinforced some of it. So like, <laughs> the, the Sierras were pretty sketchy. Um, I'm doable, but like, I definitely have even more confident, um, after getting through that. And so many people flipped, like there, there was, it was like a ghost town in this year. As most people skipped ahead and didn't, didn't go through. Um, I actually saw my first set of, um, folks that had flipped, like coming South, um, just the other day at Carson Pass. And, uh, and so it was kind of cool to talk to them about what's ahead, but, um, I don't know, it, it felt pretty good, you know, them being like, wow, y'all just, y'all went all the way through. And we're like, yep, we did all of it, you know? So, uh, I think just, uh, more confidence. I've, I've spent a lot more time, I won't say alone out here, but just, um, not connected with others as much. Uh, 
much more than on the AT. So on the AT, it just felt like this constant, like, little family, community, whatever around me. And out here, I haven't gotten that same feel. So I think just being more um, reliant on myself and, uh, and, I don't know, just toughing it out, you know, <laughs> on, on bad days. But I think also I've got a new perspective that I can look back on the AT and how I was kind of, like, ready to be done or, like, at the end and how some of the tough days were, were really hard but when I got done with AT and went back to like normal life, you know, the synthetic world, then it was like I missed even those hard days on the AT. And I can look back and go, oh, you know, oh, I remember this and I remember that. But it's like I don't really focus on the negative. I just remember all the positive things. So on the days that are hard here, I go, you know what, you're going to miss this one day. Like you're going to. You're, when you're sitting at work, you're going to miss this bad day. And you're really not going to focus on the bad days. You're going to remember the good memories. So I think that um, that I my perspective has changed a little bit because I've already done another trail. But for the most part, the things that I saw changing myself that were um, good changes, it's just like reinforced it. Okay. Uh, have you hiked? Oh, let's see. Um, also the crawl across the 700 mile mark was hilarious. <laughs> Again, like, obviously I was just acting a fool doing that, but like, uh, he's talking about like when I crossed mile 700, I just like, like crawled. But I mean, you know, I had walked past all the other ones and I literally felt like I'm never going to escape this desert. So that's just what I felt like. So I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to just share how I feel right now and act like a fool. But <laughs> I'm glad you thought it was funny. I, I wasn't sure if it would get laughs or people rolling their eyes, but you know. Either way, if you keep making the PCT seem so awesome, it'll be way too crowded next year. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not, it is awesome, so I guess I'm just, just sharing, but yeah, it is, it is a great trail, it's beautiful. I mean, the beauty out here is totally different than the beauty on the AT, you know, the AT is like the things that are in front of you, like the red Fs that come out when it rains, and like how vibrant the forest is, and here it's like, you know, just like this massive beauty, um, but I don't know, here things are, it seems so much more brutal too, like, I don't know, uh, unforgiving, you know, um, where the AT you feel kind of sheltered because you're in the green tunnel, but did you change your footwear while you were in the snow? I didn't, I didn't at all, I, I, I kept wearing trail runners and they worked just fine, um, I know a lot of people are like, oh, you gotta have, like, sturdy boots and, you know, whatever, um, but I just, I just don't do well with boots, you know, um, my Achilles had trouble with boots when I started the AT, so I, I won't go back to boots, um, Unless I just, like, had to for some reason. But I managed to make it through with trail runners just fine. And your feet are always wet in the Sierras. Always. There's just water all the time or snow. And uh, you can, if you keep them dry for several hours, you're really doing something impressive. So, do you think you'll ever go back to the Sierras JMT when it's not under 100 foot of snow? <laughs> uh, I, I, I kind of would love to. I kind of would love to see... Um, what it looks like. And, you know, I had a guy that I ran into when I was coming over Kearsarge and we were just like, there's just snow for days, you know, just tromping through it. And, uh, he met me, he was heading my way and he was like, man, I keep trying to tell myself. And I don't remember if this was back in June or if, no, it was the beginning of July. He's like, I keep trying to tell myself like, you know, that this is, this is July. And, uh, I just can't believe it with all the snow. And I was like, yeah, I was like, well, what would it normally look like? And he's like, there would literally be no snow right here in July on a normal year. And I mean, we were just on like, just piles of it, you know? So, uh, so I would like to come back, but I don't know when, you know, cause I mean, there are just so many trails, so many things that need to be hiked. Um, but yeah, I would love to come back and visit. I'm hoping to do the JMT in 2018 and it'll be my first real hike. And it seems you've missed it really because of the conditions this year. You know, I reckon, uh, I guess you could look at it like that, you know, like I missed it. Or for me, I don't know, I just look at it like I saw it like most people don't usually get to see it. So, because uh, most years it's not like this. And so I've gotten to see it like in a winter wonderland, you know, even like Christmas in July or something. And that's, um, that's just kind of the way I look at it. And that's why I went ahead through, because I know, like I said, a lot of folks that skipped and are coming back, they'll see it what it more usually looks like. Um, but... I don't know, I feel like this is special. Like, this is something that should be seen and experienced, and I can always come back in a, you know, in a normal year. But, um, but yeah, I know a lot of JMT years that just had the permit to, to through-hike the JMT this year and just decided not to. So, um, there is a, a Muir Ranch trail um, 
well, Muir Ranch is, there's a side trail to it. But anyhow, uh, a lot of times they say that the hiker box there is great because the jam tiers bring like way too much food and then they leave some of it in the hiker box. But I didn't even bother because there are like no jam tiers, not that many out there anyway this year. Uh, so I was like, there won't be that much. And sure enough, some of the folks that did go said that, you know, that it, it wasn't worth the side trail for. So I'm glad it didn't. Dixie, thanks for taking time out for us. We appreciate it. Well, I appreciate y'all. I mean, you know, without your support and the encouragement, especially like, I don't know, when y'all cheer me on and stuff, like it just, I do read it and it, you know, it really helps, especially on days that, you know, aren't uh, going the best. So thank you for spending some time with your Patreon crew. Safe travels going forward. Thank you, Gary. And what you call the synthetic world, I call the Matrix. Stole that from you, Arson. Yeah, or early riser. Yeah, it is. it is. I didn't know he called it the Matrix, but yeah, it is. That's that's what it seems like. You know, you're so like plugged in, and uh, once you get away from it, you really start to notice like how plugged in and um, how your mind is kind of controlled, I guess. So, <laughs> um, if I've learned anything from you, it's to have a positive outlook for everything. That's what's so impressive about you. Well, thank you, Ron. I, you know, I don't know. I guess I get it from my mom, I reckon. <laughs> I mean, I don't feel like I'm always that positive. Like, sometimes, you know, you have your moments. But, um, I don't know. My mom, when I was little, like, she would be like, let's let's go get lost. Like, let's, we would ride roads and stuff. And she'd be like, let's go see if we can get lost. So, instead of, like, you know, um, now when I feel like I'm lost, it's, like, exciting or something. You know what I mean? Instead of, like, oh, my God, we're lost. You know? Uh, but... And she just, my mom made everything fun. She just, um, just little dumb things that I, I can't even give you a good example. Well, we had a Coke machine, uh, outside of our house when I was little. And like, I mean, we were so broke. We were, we were so bad off, but, um, the Coke machine, like police officers in the neighborhood would stop by and, you know, get stuff out of the Coke machine. And, um, and mom was so tricky. She had like this mystery button and, uh, people knew that every third or fourth drink would be a, um, a yoo-hoo. So like people would sit there and buy like several, dr <laughs> several drinks so they could get the yoo-hoo out. And, uh, but anyway, whenever we had, like, whenever we opened that Coke machine, it was like the most exciting thing in the world to see like how many quarters were in it, you know? And then we would like go get like milk and ice cause our ice maker was burnt. I don't know. Anyway, this is a silly story to share, but anyhow, uh, my mom just always had a way of making like the smallest things so fun. And, uh, she's a very positive person and, you know, I'm thankful that, um, that she's passed some of that on to me. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. And, um, and let's see what else we have here. Just watched your crossing, crossing the line video again, just yesterday. Love it. Yeah. My, that's my mom's fault too. Oh, the guy that, um, that made that card and wrote the book and he, there, there's a book now apparently on cross the line, but the guy that designed that card contacted me cause he saw the video on YouTube and he was like, I'd love to send you a new card. And he did. And, uh, he sent the book too. And I told him, you know, I'd finish it when I, uh, or I'd read it when I finished the trail. Um, so I'm really excited to, to read that book because I feel like it's probably gotta be probably pretty good. So, um, uh, anyway, I don't know if y'all are interested in that at all. You can get those cards online and, um, and the book. Um, uh, actually I think on that video I added, um, a link to where you can find all that stuff. So anyhow, um, I don't know, it's kind of cool. Like somebody that affected my life so much, like emailed me and I, I, I was really excited about that. That was pretty neat. But anyhow, well, thank y'all very much. Um, again, I, you know, I couldn't be out here without all of y'all supporting me in one way or another. So, um, I really appreciate that. And, uh, I guess, you know, I'm not exactly sure when I will do the next um, live stream, but as soon as I get somewhere that's got good Wi-Fi, that's why I know it would be better and more helpful if I could, like, tell y'all way ahead of time, but I just, sometimes I don't know, you know, um, how, I, I hate to be like, yeah, I'm totally going to do it, and then it'd be crappy service and not be, not be able to do it, so anyway, thank y'all so much, and uh, thanks for believing in me, you know, like, when I told y'all I was going in the Sierras, it wasn't like, no, don't do it, it was like, yeah, you've got this, you know, so I, that really, that really helped me a lot, um, probably more than y'all know, so anyway, we all have a good, uh, a good afternoon, and we'll see y'all later.